Hello, welcome back to the Lasmo Brock Evolution Podcast. This episode, I'll be covering a real unique, weird, enigmatic, if not just puzzling shark, quote unquote. It's not really a shark, and I'll get into why. More closely related to ratfish, actually. But for a long time, people thought it was pretty much a shark. It's called Helicoprion. And I didn't know this book existed until I found it in a library. It's called Resurrecting the Shark by Susan Ewing. came out a couple years ago, 2017. Basically covers the time from when it was discovered in the late 19th century all the way up to present day doing CT scans on a pretty much complete tooth whorl on this cartilaginous fish. Now, I don't have all the answers, but nobody does for this really weird, really ancient fish. Of course... I'll be addressing myths, you know, funky stuff people used to think about Helicoprion, but there's more probably we don't know than what we know, although we've come a long way in the last couple of centuries about what we do know about this cartilaginous fish. So the book starts with the first Helicoprion tooth world discovery in the late 19th century in Australia. In the 19th century, there was a whole lot of fossils being discovered. That was around the time of the Industrial Revolution. And a close relative of it that lived in a much more ancient time called Edestus was already described and fairly well known. This was a shark that was known on its two uh, fin spines. At the time, it seen most paleontologists thought their jaws and teeth were actually defense mechanisms that came out of their fins and I've seen them in person I can see why they would think that because they're curved segmented sections you know shark jaw shouldn't be fossilizing it's not hard tissue and the teeth were symmetrical from side to side so although they look like teeth they're serrated they're the right shape the whole structure doesn't look like a shark jaw although come to find out you know, finding a more, a more complete one with a brain case stuck right next to it. So it was definitely a jaw. That was later on. Now, it's not too unusual for sharks to have fin spines. That occurs in sharks nowadays and back then. I think the most famous ones of ancient sharks being Tenacanthus and Hybidus. But with horn sharks, I know that those have fin spines. So it wasn't too unusual to think these weird structures were fin spines. Although, at the time, it was pretty controversial. There were some that thought there were jaws with teeth, some that thought there were fin spines for both Helicoprion and Edestus, which I can get that. You know, you're only finding part of the animal. You don't know where it goes. You just have to give it your best guesses based on the evidence you have. Now, for Helicoprion, it had this weird whirl of what looked like teeth coming out. If you've never seen a picture, I highly recommend it. I can only describe it so well. Basically, it looks almost like a snail shell where you have small sections curling in the middle and then as it extends outward, you have bigger projections that look like teeth. Eventually, it was found out that it was a jaw and teeth. But I can get why paleontologists find in this weird structure, this weird tooth whorl, be like, what the heck is this? Is this a defense mechanism? Is it an attack mechanism? And where does it go on the shark when all you're finding is the world? It wasn't until they got better specimens they could have better knowledge of it. But looking at some of the illustrations, it's really weird how they thought... The guy who first described it, Karpinski, thought it came out of the upper jaw and curled upward away from the shark. It looks really comical, but given his knowledge of just having that whirl... It was his best guess, and or it coming out of the tail. It looks like it's just kind of curled up with empty space in between the whorls. And I don't blame them, but man, does it look weird. If that were the case, you'd expect to find more of these whorls, you know, uncurled. But I guess they thought for some reason when it fossilizes, it kind of curls up. I don't know. Now, I thought this was interesting. The first paleontologist to suggest it was a mid-jaw tooth structure, which came out to be correct, was Fanny Hitchcock on the basis of finding a tooth whorl-like structure in a lobe fin fish called Onychota sigmoides, an extinct 
lope fin fish, you know, which didn't convince everybody, but, you know, you look at that whirl like arrangement of sharp teeth, you can kind of see it, how it's similar with Hel Caprion, although Hel Caprion is, of course, much more whirled, and the teeth are much more shark like. Now, the whirls, I might say they have many teeth, but it's technically only one tooth, since it's anchored in in the middle. And it has a hook-like structure where the smallest teeth, unlike other sharks, it retains all of its teeth in this whorl. Of course, they didn't know that way back when. They didn't know if it was for defense, attack, if it could unleash this thing, make it like a whip. If it used it to filter out prey on the bottom. You know, and there's still mysteries about it. But at least now we know through better analysis that it definitely belonged in the lower jaw through finding more complete specimens and it was anchored into the jaw for sure because as paleontologist Bendix Ongreen studied a well-preserved Idaho helicoprion apparently Idaho is like a hot spot for finding a lot of helicoprion tooth whorls basically he and found it was covered in cartilage so although most paleontologists knew by then it was a tooth whorl this was in the 20th century he found tessellated cartilage around the tooth whorl, which, you know, they had found the right types of vitrodentine and visodentine in the teeth to prove there were teeth, but finding it surrounded in tessellated cartilage proved it was embedded in the jaw, where the small inner teeth were probably completely covered and only a few of the top larger teeth were exposed at one time. And that was a huge leap Although now it somewhat seems like common sense. You look at the pictures, the artistic renderings, it seems to make more sense than having this long whip-like tooth apparatus. And Bendix Ongreen also surmised that it only had one whorl per shark. Before, there, there was somebody who suggested maybe that had multiple whorls, but no, it was just one whorl on the lower jaw, the middle of the lower jaw that aided in it feeding and it didn't have sharp teeth on the upper jaw he found some evidence that it had flat rectangular pavement like teeth on the top jaw to help either grind prey or move prey along into its gut which through later paleontologists finding more helicoprion fossils also showed that they probably mostly caught prey with the whorl and the upper teeth helped move it along and i see some other drawings of helicoprion and some of them show them with sharp upper teeth very shark like that's not correct although that's not unusual for paleo art to be more predictable and intense like i know with the eel like shark orthocanthus one of my favorites i've seen plenty of pictures showing it very shark like but it's more like an eel although it was more closely related to cartilaginous fish than eels one of the things that was very interesting about this book, a large part of the book was this paleo artist, Ray Troll, trying to learn more, trying to pick apart all the paleontologist's brains to see how Helicoprion was actually like, and not just guessing based on looking at the world, but actually trying to figure out the function of the world, if it was more shark-like or more ratfish-like, and just every little aspect of it you know you can only be so close to accurate based on having one truth world you don't have the whole thing preserving so they're just having their best guesses one of the biggest issues was the issue of whether it had gill slits like all modern sharks or it had a gill covering or an operculum like bony fish or modern ratfish there seemed much more evidence that Helicoprion probably had an operculum, a gill covering, not exposed gills, because there's some eugenodontids that were perfectly preserved in Lagerstatten, Bear Gulch, in the Carboniferous. You had similar ratfish-like cartilaginous fish that had a gill covering where the hyoid arch supported the operculum and didn't support the jaw. So it had that gill covering, but no slits. And that was, I wouldn't say ancestor, but definitely a relative. And you see that because Helicoprion wasn't a shark in that it had a hyoid arch supporting the jaw. It was further back, probably around the gills. So that's how paleontologists know it wasn't a shark. 
but at the same time its jaw was not fused to its skull like modern ratfish it had a kind of intermediate jaw structure where it was somewhat loosely attached but not so loosely attached like sharks but for some reason Rachel wants it to look shark like that he makes it with gill slits but I guess he has a point that nobody knows for sure there's not enough evidence so he just goes with gill slits but I still think the safer bet is to have the operculum and the author seemed to think that as well but again it's not a shark it's not a ratfish it's a stem hollow cephali whereby it was in the same general group as ratfish but more ancient where you have the elasmobronchs that includes sharks and rays holocephali the only living member are ratfish but that does not mean that helicoprion was a ratfish it was an ancient relative long before and a large part of this book was getting into CT scans of the helicoprion tooth whorl in that same tooth whorl from Idaho where Bendix Ongreen found out that it was part of the lower jaw and they found the cartilage they found it was anchored in with strong cartilage it was definitely in the lower jaw so there wasn't too many new surprises per se but it was definitely insightful to see that it was definitely anchored in with cartilage probably toward the back of the jaw definitely in the middle of the jaw and when you see these paleo illustrations of how many teeth are exposed that's all guesswork nobody knows for sure maybe it changes as it grows how many teeth are exposed what exact angle it is nobody knows for sure but definitely it was used to catch prey not so much a crushing tool because you know the teeth are clearly serrated slender great for slashing not so much for crushing if it was a crushing apparatus they would have found much more wear and tear on the teeth but they barely find any damage to it which was a large part of why paleontologists at first thought they were fin spines like why aren't they damaged but looking at what was around back then a lot of it were those cartilaginous fish and squid and other cephalopods so you see this whirl of spikes is probably great for catching these soft prey agile fish even if these helicoprions got pretty big, they're probably eating other cartilaginous fish. To be honest, there, there must have been a bunch of them and or large cephalopods. Most of the tooth whorls, it seemed that they found were only a few inches across in diameter, but they found one that was two feet in diameter. So that was a pretty big whorl. They think that the shark got up to about 30 or 40 feet. I'm sorry, I'm calling it a shark, but it was not a shark. It was a stem hollow cephalin say that three times fast definitely not a ratfish definitely not a shark but not to say it didn't look shark like there's a strong chance it probably did because it had to be agile probably had big fins you know to to move around quickly to easily maneuver i don't see why it wouldn't look torpedo shaped probably shark like could be wrong but nobody has found perfectly preserved one but maybe someday i don't know and I thought this was interesting. As the tooth whorl starts, all the teeth are practically identical in the first whorl. They're like baby teeth. They get bigger in the second whorl. And then starting in the third whorl, they start progressively getting bigger after a certain tooth number. But after that number, each new tooth after that, which are made at the corner back of the jaw, and the old teeth go toward the center of the whorl, covered by cartilage progressively they get bigger and bigger so unlike modern sharks the more I thought about it modern sharks the bigger teeth are toward the middle and the front to catch the fish and start slashing whereas the way helicoprion teeth work the bigger ones are toward the back not to say that it only had small teeth in the front you know they're pretty similar sized but I thought it was interesting so it might have worked like a conveyor belt it might have worked like stab and slash either way it was a really successful predator that was around for millions of years but it seemed to be so specialized that was its downfall as its prey species went extinct it probably went extinct too 10 to 15 million years before the largest mass extinction you know it's a large specialized predator so that doesn't surprise me you look at megalodon it went extinct when not much else was going extinct around 3.5 million years ago you know that's not surprising it went extinct because it had a large food demand it was very specialized in what it ate wasn't an apex predator per se maybe a lot like a sperm whale where sperm whales 
eat a lot of squid. They're really specialized, but they leave most other stuff alone. Maybe Helicoprion was like that, apex predator in a certain way. Although it's interesting, it said it might have still been able to eat hard-shelled prey if it could like shuck it somehow and like use its conveyor belt of teeth to kind of pull out the cephalopod. But it's pure guesswork, but I thought it was an interesting thought. And that was actually brought up by somebody who wasn't a paleontologist, but the paleontologist took note of it. Helicoprion is not the only cartilaginous fish in that family, Eugenodontid, that has a tooth world. You also have Sarcoprion, which was discovered in either Norway or Greenland. You have Lizoprion, Parahelicoprion. Around that time period in the early to mid Permian, it was definitely almost worldwide and very successful. And then eventually it went extinct, but at that time period, it was very successful. Yeah, actually it was tooth number 85 that all teeth before tooth 85 was about the same size and shape. And then after tooth 85, the individual tooth size, shape, and proportion changes with each new one getting bigger by small fractions of an inch. So they were studying these with those digital calipers most likely. And that's what they noticed. They're pro that's probably when they hit puberty, they were saying... And I, was, I was surprised at the CT process. It's apparently very expensive and very painstaking in both how long it takes to do all the CT scans and then they had to fix the data to make it readable. You would think, you know, you have these CT scans, it shows you everything, but no, they had to go in and color code it and clean up the data. Sound very exhaustive, but, you know, they, they found what they were looking for. Definitely strong cartilage holding that whirl in because it wasn't attached to the jaw is actually just held in by cartilage but strong cartilage and to get a general estimate of how big it was based on the tooth whorl if the largest whorl was just over a foot in diameter 12 inches it was probably around 16 to 26 feet with a head 3 to 5 feet long so that's that's pretty sizable shark and considering the whorls could get twice that big up to 40 feet maybe you know that's a big apex predator of whatever it's feeding on. That was by Lebedev, who also conducted microscopic studies of well-preserved tooth crowns. He didn't find marks on the teeth per se, but saw scratches or traces of scratches aligned in a way indicating bite force applied between jaws. So it probably used a combination of using its tooth whorl slice and stab and using the upper teeth to kind of help it move its prey back. So probably more grasping and tearing and less saw action or crushing. You know, it probably, like most sharks, use side to side head movement, though probably not as violent, maybe. I mean, its, it's teeth were really serrated and big. The teeth became big, but it's not like its upper jaw did much of the action. It's mostly the lower jaw doing the slicing. That's about most if not all of the main interesting points it's a very interesting mysterious cartilaginous fish one of the most interesting extinct animals in general i believe because it has this weird structure that has never been replicated you know there's animals that have had tooth like whorls but when you google fossil tooth whorl this thing instantly pops up like what the heck I can see why people would think it would be more of a whip-like structure if there wasn't well-preserved specimens with the cranium and cartilage nearby, you know. It was a big predator, not a shark, but a shark relative of sorts. So it belongs on this podcast, I feel, even if it's not a member of Elasmobronchi. And I feel like this book is just scratching the surface with Paleozoic sharks. I wish it would have gone more into other members of Eugenodontid, but that's where most of the research and CT scans have gone toward the enigmatic tooth whorl. Although a lot of those other Paleozoic sharks are pretty interesting, pretty weird, or at least foreign compared to modern sharks in their own universe, it almost feels like. Same with, it's going off topic a little bit, but you had the mammal like reptiles, quote unquote. He had Dimetrodon with his big sail. So it, it's pretty interesting that that lived at the same time as Helicoprion with this large tooth whorl. 
even if only the top teeth in the world were showing at one time it would still must have had an interesting bite and mouthful of teeth you know people don't know exactly how it was oriented how much of the teeth were showing if it was in the back of the jaw or fossilization just makes it seem like it was in the back of the jaw how much of the jaw it covered you know what exactly it was eaten I'd be real interested if they find a really well preserved one even better preserved than the ones they found you know that have more of those soft structures and fins and stuff but that's really rare I wouldn't count on it but uh yeah I don't, again I don't have all the answers with Helicopter on but if you guys have any general questions I might be able to answer them um so much has been learned about it but so much remains to be seen and uh yeah it's one of those animals it's like wow that's really unique and it's so ancient it lived before the dinosaurs that you know there's nothing else like it had to have been doing something right but why has nothing like that come around since then? You know, maybe it's just luck of modern sharks. Just more simplistic, generalist, general type of strategies. Not just focusing on soft-bodied prey. That's what it seems to be, but you never know. But they're really large and specialized, so I wouldn't say they had it coming. Definitely all extinctions are a bit of bad luck. But, I don't know, all species go extinct sooner or later anyways. Yeah. Alright, so thanks for listening. Alright, see you.